Hey YouTube, welcome to a new video. Uh, this week we're going to be working on faces some more, which might sound, if you watched the last video, uh, like I'm running it back. And I assure you that is not the case. I wanted to take a, a bit of time this week to talk about transferring some of those 2D face and hair techniques that we discussed onto 3D objects. So as a lot of you may know, I do paint miniatures as well as Magic the Gathering altars, and I wanted to spend some time essentially showing how the crossover in those techniques works, what is the same and what is different, and give you a couple of handy ways to paint faces on your miniature figures, but also maybe give you a bit of an insight into some of the whys and what's, which can help you in applications that are both 2D and 3D. So let's get into that, and uh, hopefully we can help you out. First of all, for my planning stages, I want to take a look at a more sort of GW classic method. So I'm starting to just think about what they do for their flesh workups here. And it's usually just three colors, basically. They start off with Bugman's Glow, which is a red-brown. Then they go into Cadian Flesh Tone, usually. And finally up into Kislev Flesh. Um, on the box art, they may not necessarily show this in most of their tutorials, but on the box art and on the image I have here, they do show the shaved head part, which is a blending technique where you make it look like a shaved head, and I wanted to show that as well. Whether or not they would include it in a tutorial is hard for me to say, but it is simple, so I figured I may as well. Thinking about the differences in my own approach now, um, they're, they're fairly subtle actually. The majority of the colors are the same, and, and actually I ended up using the same palette of colors for both of these, just manipulating them differently. So I would always start at a, a dark kind of red-brown myself, and Bugman's Glow is fine for that. I don't actually own it, so I mixed it. Then I'd start glazing up through mid-tones to more of what you would expect to see as a flesh tone. So that again is gonna be something like Acadian flesh tone. I'm gonna use some little blue glazes around the ears just to cool down the red spots there. And then for my final highlights, I'm going to use a very pale, almost bony color. So again, not far from Kislev Flesh. All right, we're back. So now we have a plan, and a plan is very important. A plan helps you have confidence, and that's really why I so insist that people try to have a plan. It's, it's really nothing to do with necessity in a physical need. It just helps inform you as to where you're going, where you're at, where you're planning to end up, where you where you want the finished product to be. And so from there, because you've you've given yourself a set of instructions for how to get to that finished product, you know that you're just che checking off boxes, and that kind of makes things feel a little bit less stressful, lets you focus more on what you're producing and just get the work done. So that's why we went down and just made a little initial plan of how we wanted to do it, what we wanted to do. Um, you'll also notice in that planning stage, we were talking about both the GW method and my own method for doing faces. Now the reason for that is just because GW is what most people know, it's what most people relate to and recognize. The majority of painters out there paint using that method still. And so it seemed to make sense to do a comparison between those two styles of painting, my style and GW's, um, because that's gonna give you the best idea of how what I, talk, what I talk about doing, what I like to do, makes a difference. Um, so we're going to go into some sped up footage next and we're going to start to take a look at, first of all, me painting with a GW approach. This isn't going to be a perfect GW approach because I really don't paint this way very often, but I'm going to be trying to paint in a similar way to how GW would produce box art. And this is to give you that point of reference, that comparison between how GW does their faces and how I do my faces. Um, I will be talking over this as well at the same time, so there will be some little edits and uh, annotations and, and things to help you kind of figure out what I'm doing. Uh, you will be able to paint along if you wish to, whether or not you actually want to go the whole hog of uh, you know, painting something in the GW style and then painting something in my style, I don't know. But I'm going to give you both because I feel like that's the fairest comparison. So let's get on with that footage now and take a look at, first of all, me painting a Stormcast Sequitor in the GW style. Okay, so we're gonna get started now with this GW style. I had to mix Bugman's Glow, and I have got Cadian Flesh Tone, and I didn't have a Kislev Flesh, so I've got a bone to add to that. First of all, you're gonna see me just going through all of the flesh areas and applying that Bugman's Glow. Um, this needs to be pretty solid coverage when you're doing it in the GW style. 
it's something that you're going to want to get on as a, a fairly thick layer. Um, I, I say thick by my standards. I do paint with a wet palette, so all of my paints are quite thin by default. But if you need to get more solid coverage, you can just give it a second coat. Then I'm going to flesh wash it. They would normally apply a Raiklin flesh shade here over that Bugman's Glow. I don't personally think this shows up super well, but it is something that I've always seen them do in the GW tutorials, so I did want to stick to it. The uh, flesh tone from Army Painter was the nearest thing I had. Now we're going to go over to the Cadian flesh tone, and again, we're layering fairly solidly, but the GW method says that we should leave the areas where the recesses are now and only paint on the surfaces. So you can see that this color is a big step up from the color underneath it, and that's kind of where my first problem starts to occur and why I don't paint in this style anymore, because this jump is quite big and it ends up looking like a very harsh change. Now, I'm fairly sure that when I watch these tutorials and they tell me to apply this as a layer, they are actually doing some degree of blending in between because my results definitely looked choppier than I've seen a lot of the results from tutorials look previously. However, I decided to stick with it because I realized that it doesn't look so bad. It's not something that really looks terrible. And we do now have some good shading and some good definition. So I was fairly happy. I had to go back and make a couple of little micro adjustments here and there. And you will see me messing around with that a bit. But for the most part, this all went fairly straightforward. Now you can see on this super zoom, I'm just showing how fairly solidly layered that is. And as we go into this final section now, I'm going to start to be picking out highlights. And again, in these tutorials, we're normally told to stick to raised areas like cheekbones, the ridge of the nose, the ridge of the ears, the top of the eyes, sometimes a little on the forehead, uh, usually the top lip but not the bottom lip, the point of the chin, things like that. And you can see me applying that here. And I did notice that once these highlights are on, the context of all of those three tones beside each other actually starts to make it make more sense. The shades start to look softer once you have the highest highlight to compare them to. I'm now moving on to the shade for the shaved head part. And what I'm doing here is I used the blue contrast paint. The, the royal blue one, the name escapes me off the top of my head, but I'll put it on screen. And I thinned it right down to a super thin glaze, and I'm just glazing it up towards the thicker part of the hair. And you'll see as layers build up, it does start to look like a shaved head. Personally, I've never been a huge fan of using just blue for this, because I find that I have to correct a lot of it with pink flesh tones. And so I did glaze some, fle some flesh tones back onto that, just to compensate for anywhere that it had gotten a bit too blue. Then coming in with some black for the hair. This is flat black from Reaper. You would probably use a bad and black if you were obeying a tutorial, but I prefer flat black personally. Then a gray that's uh, something like a mechanical standard gray, just to tip onto the front of the hair and the little strands that are going down the face. And then we're gonna move up to a gray that's more like an eshin gray. And again, just shrinking those highlights, getting nearer to the front of the hair. All right, so that was a quick look over a, a basic kind of GW style workup for painting that sectoral face. Now, obviously, I can't perfectly reproduce the way you know people like like the guys at Warhammer TV or how their box art painters um, do those pieces. I'm kind of just doing my rendition in the same style. And we got pretty close to the kind of thing that they produce. Um, hallmarks of that style tend to be things like um, very hard shadow terminations. You know, the point where the shadow meets the mid-tone being quite hard. You tend to find the same thing with the highlights, where the highlight meets the mid-tone. It's usually not blended through. It's usually just kind of layered once or twice. At one point in that sped up footage, I did do a little a little super zoom. That is closer than the eye can see, 
but I did it just to kind of show you that the paint is transparent. If you were to look at that miniature, that's not what you'd actually see, and it isn't when I look at it. I can grab it right now and I can take a look at it, and I don't see that transparency in the paint with my naked eye. But as soon as I put it uh, under that super zoom on my camera, which is actually used for focus finding, um, I can see the transparency in the paint. And I do that every now and again. I actually use my camera for that just to check because even in that GW style, they do still layer up. And obviously, so some of the paint does still need to be transparent to give a kind of sense of blending. We're gonna go now into some sped up footage of me doing things in my style. Because I don't do any washes or anything, I'll need to do fewer cuts here because there won't be as much drying time. There'll be some little patches of drying time, but I should be able to do significantly fewer cuts, which means you're probably gonna see here pretty much a start to finish of me doing it. There will obviously be commentary over the top of it where needed, so you will be kind of still clued up on everything that's going on. But um, I want to get on with that now and show you the differences in how I approach painting the same sequitur, just in my style. Okay, so as I alluded to previously, I'm still going in with the same red-brown to start out with. I don't own a Bugman's Glow, but I'm actually thinking about picking one up because it is very similar to the colour that I start my flesh from. And to be honest with you, I tend to use the, I, I tend to mix that colour almost every time I paint a face. So this is basically the same as you saw on the previous workup, just with the Bugman's Glow. The only difference being I like to leave a couple of just tiny, tiny spots of black still visible, and that is something that you wouldn't normally do. His, that was my secret weapon that you just saw on screen briefly. That's uh, Painter's Milk from the Painter's Bakery. I'll leave a link in the description to where to get that. It's um, a thinning and glazing agent, which as you can see, now that I've started to lighten that flesh tone by adding some Cadian flesh tone to my Bugman's Glow, I'm now glazing that in towards the highlight points and that medium really does help with that. I'm specifically targeting the upper half of all of the shapes within the face here. So instead of just looking for raised edges of the miniature, I'm brightening anything that I feel is closer to the light source. So I'm going up towards the crown of the head, I'm going up towards the front of the head, I'm going uh, down towards the base of the jawline to bring a little highlight to that. Um, and there is an element of rule of cool here. It's not necessarily all strictly obeying the rules, but it is intended to be a bit more realistic overall. I'm continuing to lighten that color now. I've added more Cadian flesh tone and I will keep doing that until I get all the way up to pretty much pure Cadian flesh tone and continually just adding those glazes and shrinking them each time I add more light to them, pushing them further and further towards those upper volumes in the face, the areas that I think should be the brightest, should be catching the light, um, and just, you know, a few little concessions to rule of cool here or there. For example, the bottom of the jawline, as I expressed previously, it wouldn't really pick up a ton of light, but by highlighting it, you create good overall shape definition to the face itself. You separate it from the rest of the miniature a little bit. Think of it kind of how you would do black lining on a paneled miniature, like a Space Marine, for example. It just gives you a really nice point of termination between one volume and the next. So I do like to do that. We're getting up pretty bright now, so I'm starting to pick out things like ears, tip of the nose, uh, the chin, the top lip. I leave the bottom lip because I'm going to come back into that and sort of pink it back up a bit just by glazing some Bugman's Glow over some of the slightly lightened colour that's already on there. You will see me do that at some point, but I'm mostly focusing here on just pushing light towards the top of the head. Now we're starting to get really bright with that are very small areas. There's a little bit of micro correction going on at the same time. You're okay to do that if you're if you're using fairly thin transparent paints that um, don't cover in one hit. You do get a bit more forgiveness to be able to come backwards and forwards and just make little micro corrections here and there in any areas that you're not happy. We're up to almost our brightest highlight already here, so we are at a good place to be making little corrections.
things and you're just obsessing over some small details that I wasn't happy with. That's one of the things that slowed me down a little on this, to be honest with you. I wanted to um, just make sure that I was giving it as much refinement as I would if I were painting it for myself. We're up to a super bright colour now. This is a uh, representation of Kislev Flesh. It's basically Cadian Flesh tone with some of that Mojave White from Scout 75 added into it. But I think this is about as bright as I get now, and I'm really using very, very little paint here. That's me correcting the lip. I'm just re edging some of the blacks in to ensure that everything's got nice definition to it. Now I'm mixing the glaze for the shade. You can see the difference in mine. It's more of a blue-gray. It takes about three coats to start showing up, but whilst it may not be as bold as the way that the traditional GW sort of style would normally apply it. I think having a blue-gray gives something that looks a lot more natural. So it took me a couple of coats to get this as strong as I wanted it, but I was far more pleased with the overall result. It felt more like actual dark hair that had been shaved and not like an effect. Now I'm just pinpointing some blue glazes around the ears. This is just to cool them down. The ears can get very, very warm. They tend to be a center for a lot of different shades to fall into on most faces. So I like to just get a really light blue and gray and gently glaze it in there, just to try and cool off some of that redness. I'm starting to highlight the hair now. And I'm still using gray as much as GW would, but again, I'm adding blues to my grays. Um, and I'm adding ivory to my grays. So what's happening here effectively is that my highlights are getting colder as they're getting brighter. And that means that I can start to tip them all the way towards a sort of icy white kind of blue gray. And that's going to allow me to give a, an impression of reflection. I do have to go back a few times with some quite heavily thinned down black just to correct between the strands of hair where I've been a little bit inaccurate with the brush. But that's okay, as long as you're willing to do that. It's a small investment in correction, but the overall thing that you get is very nice. I know the focus isn't super great when we're top down like that. It's quite hard to get enough depth of field to catch the whole thing at every angle, but I have just shown it off at a flatter angle for you so that you can see that kind of reflective look that we put into the hair. I like to keep it nice and glossy, you know, something that looks sort of fairly realistic. Now just some final sparkly highlights. This is almost entirely pure Mojave White. Just a little bit of blue in it to cool it off. A bit more of that black glaze just to correct. And there she is. Now I've done these comparison photos to just sort of show the difference under a close zoom. I should point out, I've said this a few times throughout the video, it is a bit closer than the naked eye can see, but it does give you an idea of how much extra smoothing you get using the glazing. And that extra smoothing is really what sells that kind of dynamic look of light hitting at various levels in different areas, and that skin isn't a uniform thing. And I think that's really important to making this look like something that feels at least kind of real. So just a couple of last quick looks at that now. You can see that's all blended through nicely. Okay, so after looking at those comparison images, you can see that we get two pretty different results. Now, the first one, the, the, the one that's represented on the left is obviously my attempt at painting in that very kind of box art -y, GWE sort of style, which is not something I'm super familiar with, but I tried to do it in the spirit of, of how they tend to advise people to do it. So I wasn't really trying to paint to the very best of my ability, and I was trying to be fairly quick. 
the end result of doing that was that I spent about 20 minutes on it and I got a face that I quite liked. I didn't particularly have any huge problems with how it looked, you know, at sort of six to eight inches away from my face and um, in, 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 you know, the same sort of studio light that I have here to paint under. Um, however, something that I noticed, and this is quite a major difference, is that when I did my own piece, in my style, it only took me about 30 minutes. Now that's quite um, a significant difference if you look at it maybe as a percentage, 50% if you spend two hours on a model, that would take a model from two hours to three hours. And you may not be willing to invest that much extra time. But with the face being such a focal point on a miniature, I've always been of the opinion that it can be really worth your while to paint the majority of the miniature fairly quickly with not too many tricks and then to focus on that face and try to do something a little bit nicer on the face and it really makes the whole miniature look quite elevated. So I gave you those pictures in the comparison that show some really close zooms and again as I said previously they are a bit closer than the naked eye can see. Those transparencies and, and the, the layering effects, they look very different to the naked eye and when you observe those miniatures they actually look much smoother, much more blended than when you see those very close up, very crisp high quality photographs of them, especially when I've started to zoom them in even further to stretch them to, to really show off that, that process and that detail. Now, when you're doing this yourself, you're gonna to want to be able to see how those colors need to lay on top of each other. And that's why I've gone to that point of showing you something that won't actually look like the finished result. However, what you see when I'm painting on the down cam and it's more zoomed out, and you can actually see me working away at it, that's a lot closer to what you see with the naked eye. And so you can see from those, those parts of the down cam videos where I'm actually moving the miniature around and showing you how it looks from different angles, a truer representation of, of what you're actually going to get for your effort. Now I think the way that I paint the miniatures, um, it, it, to me, I think it's, it's a little bit of extra investment for quite a lot of extra output. What you get at the end of it is something that looks more smoothly blended, it's easier to express light, you, you've got better overall contrast even. The, the more traditional GW style of painting, the reason it doesn't really work for me is simply because you're essentially just putting a really, really dark colour into the very recesses and a really, really light colour onto the very edges, but you're not really thinking about how something might be lit in any sort of realistic situation. So whilst you do get miniatures with a greater overall contrast, the expression of that contrast doesn't really lend itself to something that looks natural, and that for me just doesn't work. So I developed my painting style and my painting techniques really quite recently. I always painted to that very kind of box arty GW tutorial style. And what I was trying to do was be able to produce miniatures where I could more appropriately express them being in an environment or being under a particular type of lighting or just looking a bit more natural. You know, the way light plays across skin. If you look at my face right now, you can see that light is falling onto my face in in a lot of different ways from a lot of different angles and, and there isn't just a uniformity to it. And it can seem very complex to apply that in paint. And so I think a lot of the time people fall back on that, that way that they've always been shown, that way that those tutorials have shown them in the past. Because painting uniformly with something that looks quite good is a lot less daunting than trying to actually think about where things need to sit and how bright and how dark you want different areas and blend in between them. But I hope what I've demonstrated with those two sections of sped up footage is that it's not actually that hard to move to that next level. And there are levels that you can go to beyond that. There are painters far more accomplished than me who can really precisely nail those blends down to being perfectly smooth, even under an ultra zoom. And they can give something that looks really beautifully clean and crisp. And it always ju it's just a case of practice. It's just a case of carrying on and carrying on. So I really do hope that you'll attempt to, to maybe try and level up from that, that standard approach to painting and try something a little bit more advanced. Try something that actually pushes you to use a few unfamiliar techniques. 
Things like doing away with washes will be a wonderful way to improve your painting. You really don't need them for things like faces. They're good, at, they're good with metals, they're good with very highly textured surfaces, but something like a face is so much easier to express where you want the light and shadow to land just by using paint. And when you want to start filtering and adjusting things, that's when you bring glazes in. So I have tried to show all of that. If you do have any questions, of course, you're always welcome to comment below, ask me, and I will try to answer one-on-one -on -one any specifics that you might be struggling with. But until the next video, that is all I've got time for today. So thank you so much for tuning in. Links to my social media will be down in the description below. And uh, I will also put a list in there of the paints that I used because I don't have all of the GW paints. So I have had to use my nearest equivalents or mix things. So I will explain all of that as well. Thanks for watching everybody and I'll see you in the next one. Hey again everyone. Um, I, would, I don't normally do this and this isn't something that I would ever intend to make a habit of, but as I got to the end of editing this video today, I noticed a couple of things that I just wanted to make some little corrections to and also there was another thing that I wanted to add that I neglected to say. Um, I quite often during this video mention GW painting tutorials and box art as if they're one and the same thing and as if they're directly comparable. Obviously the work that Evy Metal produces is supposed to be to a much higher standard than the, uh, the Battle Ready and the How to Paint tutorials that you see on Warhammer TV for example. And those tutorials are an excellent resource for getting started as a painter. I don't want the video to come off like I'm saying I'm so much better than those because that's just really not how I like to approach any other content creation. Um, the point more that I was trying to make is that the heavy metal style on the box art acts as a reference for those painting tutorials and I wanted to show that with not too much of an extra time investment you can push further than that and towards something that is more representative of you know similar to an heavy metal style um, but with my approach which you know does contain some differences. Um, now that that's out of the way the other thing I wanted to, to make a point of mentioning is that at the start of the video, I did talk about how um, these techniques for painting faces would relate to 2D painting. And obviously I know that over the course of the video, I've not gone on to explain any direct comparisons as to where those relationships are. That is deliberate and that is because I want you to be able to look at my video for painting 2D faces and my video for painting 3D faces and be able to draw your own conclusions of where the similarities lie. If you have questions about where the, the technical crossovers are, more than happy to answer those in the comments. Um, but I didn't want anybody to think that I'd perhaps missed a section out of the video. It is very deliberate because I don't like to force people to my conclusions. I like to try and invite them to draw their own conclusions when I'm trying to teach things. Um, the last thing I want to say, and it is a little bit more of a somber note, is obviously we are in the middle at the moment of a global pandemic. Uh, the COVID-19 disease is affecting people massively and all of our lives at the moment are nothing like how we expected them to be or how we, we've known them to be previously. This is probably the single greatest uh, social event disaster to take place for, for generations and honestly one of the comparisons that I've heard that really struck the biggest chord with me is that this is the nearest that we will know what it's like to live during wartime you know for example during the second world war um when there was rationing and when um you know people were financially devastated as a result of that action um it is a very very serious time and there are a lot of really negative feelings going around at the moment and i just want to make it clear that i i have the utmost of respect for everybody for all of the amazing things that we're seeing people do during this hard time all of the above and beyond that we're seeing from people but also that I would like to say that I am there for anyone within my community whether it be people that follow me on social media people that watch my twitch streams or uh, people that are recently watching these YouTube videos if there's things that you want to discuss pressures that you're under at the moment I do try to get to people I'm always happy to help and um, just that I wanted to say to everybody to, to try and keep looking as much on the bright side as you can let yourself and just keep trying hard to follow the advice of your government, uh, be responsible, be careful and hopefully we'll get through all of this and it'll all be okay. But thank you everybody again and I'll see you in the next video.